those glasses wouldn't look flattering on anyone, but they really don't help his cause because these little tiny circles are lost <laughs> in the sea of bald head <laughs> flesh. Yeah. Fuck that shit. <laughs> Motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. <laughs> Right, everybody. It's one fucking hour time. I'm Evan Husney. Of course, this is the show where we talk about one goddamn movie and we have just one fucking hour to do it. Uh, to my left, we got Big T, Tom Fitzgerald, aka Tom Fitzgerald. What's going on, T? Where am I? Where, <laughs> this way? I'm doing Biden jokes because you can now. Oh my Nobody god! Nobody gives a fuck. Let's make fun of Biden, yo. Oh my god! Holy shit! Okay, god that's how we're service. starting this. All right. Yes. Okay. God bless your service. <laughs> and okay, and then well, I guess I better say to the far right, we got uh, Marcus uh, Herring. What's going on, Mister? That's Marcus? right. I don't do topical humor. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but I, you know, I am usually just on the topic of the show. I'm usually so nervous that we only have an hour to get, you know, enough uh, to, to talk about the movie. Yeah. But tonight I'm feeling really good. I think an hour Dude. is like more than enough time. Yeah. For this, <laughs> this thing, this has been like a white whale Moby Dick or something like, <laughs> like this is this is why this show exists. Mm hmm. Yes, absolutely. Like this. <laughs> so what are what are we what are these guys talking about? Well, we're in the thick of our summer series here on the program, uh, One Fucking Summer, where we are examining one film from each year of the 90s. Tonight is 1994, and we are looking at, oh boy, in long form, we're going to be discussing for the first time Oliver Stone's Natural Born Killers. Right. <laughs> Oft referenced on One Fucking Hour. But this is the deep dive. Yes, we have. We did we touch have, on it once before, right? Well, yes. We, we brought it up many times. No, no. But, but did we, we do it for movies we hate? Because I actually did. have watched it for one. But, yes. And I don't know if we actually talked about it or not. We did. We we mm. talked about it for yeah. about five minutes <laughs> uh, on the uh, movies we hate live stream that we did uh, a while back wow. now. So. But, but but to be fair, we did tease on that program that someday, and that day is today, we were going to do it in long form for the full fucking hour. And that's what we're here to do. Talk about this fucking piece of shit. <laughs> so that's what we're going <laughs> to do. All right, all right. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Um, yeah. All right, so, uh, but before we get into that, I just want to give a quick shout out to the One Fucking Hour Patreon. Patreon.com slash One Fucking Hour is where you can sign up for just five bucks a month and get instant access to all of our uh, audio commentary tracks, bonus episodes, and get 24-hour early access to every single episode. So you can be the cool kid in school that checks out our app before everybody else does if you sign up. Uh, and we're going to have a new bonus episode drop. Hopefully, we'll record it next week. I, I, I'm, I'm really hoping we do that uh, The with the uh, idea of, we're since we're doing this 90s movie uh, sort of marathon here, we're going to mm -hmm. get into the 90s movies that we haven't seen Right, and try to explain to one another what we think those movies are about, the ones we haven't seen. So, <laughs> for example, yeah. I don't have any idea what's going on with Jurassic Park. What? <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I love no that. idea. I love wow. that. No idea. And I, I would that. be, I would probably have a weird synopsis. That's all right. the story. <laughs> right. Yeah. I actually, um, like put together a pretty fun list of the movies that I haven't seen from the 90s already. I'm very fired up about this yeah. and it, it's, cool. it's going to be very embarrassing. So yeah. the only way to see that uh, one fucking hour in the 90s movies we haven't seen will be up on the Patreon or if you're watching this on YouTube, you can click the join button and become a moment of the YouTube channel and you get the same perks for the same price, same bullshit just on YouTube instead of Patreon. So Thanks to everyone who signed up already and supporting us. We really appreciate it. It's the best way to support the show. Yeah. So um, we're talking 94, guys. Uh, mm -hmm. Any anecdotes on, on 94? I mean, what comes to mind for me, which is very topical for tonight's film, uh -huh. is O.J. Simpson is 94. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. You weird. know, uh, Nancy Kerrigan, Tanya Harding conflict. Um, you mm -hmm. know, Lion King's in the theater. Kurt Cobain dies. Yeah, we you lose know, Kurt. Uh, we got? John Benet as a hit. John Benet Ramsey, um, one of my John favorites. John Benet Ramsey. Okay. Yep. Um, what else we got? 
Forrest Gump. Yes, Gump happens. I remember <laughs> I was going down the street and billboards would suddenly say, Gump happens. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, all the, that's what the pre-release billboards would say. And I, I was like, what's Gump? Yeah. And I got excited because I didn't know what it was. I thought it was some weird ad campaign. It was going to be yeah, like a... For some, yeah, Gen X punk band or something. Yeah, Gump yeah. happens. It, it is funny that all those 90s like media crime things happen the same year as this movie. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, this is, is the response. Kind of odd, also, right? I got to say, Pulp Fiction came out this year. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of big and big time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's very interesting to always compare this film and Pulp Fiction, too. And uh, I was doing that on this recent hell watch of uh nbk <laughs> and i was comparing them and i'm not whenever i i don't want to get ahead of myself but just uh there's there is a simple filmmaking quality to pulp fiction yes it might speak you might have other opinions about there's other parts that are cringy and campy and have dated badly but like simply comparing the elegance oh my God. of filmmaking <laughs> pulp fiction mm -hmm. yeah uh and this horse shit uh we'll get there. it was it's always an interesting <laughs> thought experiment you yeah. know so uh, yeah, just anyway that so anyway so, that's the year it's 1994. Right, you know, and, these and, two and films happen. Just to clarify, if you're if you've stumbled across you know this episode amongst a sea of our other ones, tonight's actually episode 109. Uh, but the um, other 90s films we've covered are, are mostly films that we really like and you know are very unique. Uh, you know we, we we're, we've done you know uh, Cape Fear, we did Slacker, we did um, Help Me Out, uh, Shortcuts. You know we've done some interesting films. Yeah. And so this tonight is a strap in for a dunkable. Uh, this is a dunkable episode yeah. where, you know, we're going to be putting this film in the dunk tank and really examining it because it is a brutal two hours to get through. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and it's part of a pr proud tradition here. I would yes. say that maybe like uh, one out of 10 films we cover on the, the show dunkable. is we call a dunkable. You know, like yep. they're in the dunking booth and we keep yep. hitting that target. Mm -hmm. And that started with Magnolia. So it has a rich history. Yep. And this film it should uh, proudly join the ranks yep. of other uh, miserable Dunkables. horse shit like uh, <laughs> that we've covered in our dunkable uh, <laughs> segments. Yeah. So, all right, everybody strap in, get your tiny sunglasses ready because we're getting into oh. Natural Born Killers. I'm going to get that clock started. God, the sunglasses. <laughs> okay, here we go. And uh, all right, boom. And of course, as customary on the program, I'm going to read here. A little synopsis action for Natural Born Killers. <clears throat> All right, so Woody Harrelson and Juliette Lewis star as Mickey and Mallory Knox, white trash in love who go on the lam after murdering Mallory's parents, weaving a path of death and destruction throughout the Southwest. Both demanding of attention and disdainful and disdain, excuse me, of the media, uh, they become unlikely celebrities. Uh, also, you have the bloodthirsty tabloid reporter Wayne Gale, played by Robert Downey Jr reports their every move to an adoring public while warden Dwight McCluskey, played by Tommy Lee Jones, is only too eager to welcome such celebrities to his prison. Uh, NBK is something Oliver Stone would probably call a wild-eyed satire on the media's glorification of and complici complicity in crime, but Natural Born Killers is something I would call an exhausting and punishing overly stylized exercise in hollow social commentary. Wow. So. <laughs> is that Criterion? What is that? <laughs> <laughs> what is that quote? No, Did you write just, that? This is the old pulling from a few things, but yes. That, okay, that is, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I, uh, I thought for a second as you were reading along that it was the back of the Criterion. Yeah, no, that's, yeah. that's actually from the press book uh, to the movie. Uh, yeah, no, okay, kidding. sorry. <laughs> so anyway, we've talked about this, obviously, as we alluded to earlier previously on the show, but let's get into it. Um, maybe let's start, Marcus. I'm gonna start with you. Do you have any personal history background with this film, and and, and what's your gen general take on MBK? Well, of course, this was my one of my picks uh, pr uh, for movies we hate. Oh. Remember, so um, yes. I'm a proud hater. I always yeah. have been. I don't even think I saw it all the way through until that episode. Now I've seen it like twice. Much to my You're saying until you watched it for until yeah until our first movies we hate episode. I don't think I even watched it all the way through. Although I'd seen parts of it, obviously. Wow. Jeez. And I, I, you know, I, I, uh, I, it, I was a teen when it came out. Mm -hmm. It was very popular. <clears throat> the soundtrack was in every kid's oh. 
you know, CD player uh, room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like people rolling joints off the uh, case <laughs> yeah. and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it, you know, it. I didn't have to watch it back then to hate it. To hate it. To know that I didn't like it. You know, mm-hmm. like that didn't like the nine inch nails part of it. I didn't like all the different. Um, you know, like film textures and stuff. To me, it looked like it was pandering, trying to, you know, be cool. It looked like an old, it looked like what it is. It's kind of like an old fart trying to be cool in 90s, right. you know? And yeah. it, it had this sort of, uh, it was doing the different textures thing reminded me so much back then of MTV Sports, which would like have all these Dutch camera angles totally. and we cut to black and white for no reason. And then cut Dan to Cortez, like a, right? Can, yeah. Dan cut Cortez. Up. Right. <laughs> so it had that to me, it looked like someone like that. Oliver Stone was just watching MTV sports. Yeah. was like that. That's what the kids are into these days. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah, and, exactly. Uh, and also just like you're saying, it's, it's, it's an old boomer who's trying to do a gen X mm-hmm. move and, uh, and going like, they watch like five music videos. Right. And you know, he try and, you're always in trouble when you try to do that 90s music video style mm-hmm. into a feature film made for adults. Yeah. And yeah. S- uh, shout out to another old dunkable is Psycho 2. Yeah. Which right. had cutaways to like Psycho 98. Naked, yeah. Psycho 98. Yeah, sorry, Psycho 98. The the uh, reboot. And no, but it had like, you know, overweight uh, naked women with masks mm-hmm. and cattle and stuff. And this <laughs> film has that in excess, but like yeah. There is right. a there's a spiritual connection to uh, Psycho ninety eight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. This was such a big movie too, and it, it appealed to certain people. Like it kind of appealed to like white trash people. In my experience growing up, the oh, kids yeah. that were like the stoner hoodie, mm-hmm. you know, like white trash kids really thought this was like the artsiest movie ever made. You know, like it was like basically art house for them. I think. And mm-hmm. so there was another element to it there where I just felt like, ah, oh, this, I don't feel like I should like this, you know, it didn't appeal to yeah. me. Totally. Yeah. And s- strangely enough, just my quick anecdote is, uh, and I'll be brief because the clock's running, but maybe we can afford some time, uh, <laughs> is, uh, uh, <laughs> this past Friday I was traveling during the nightmare glitch, uh, you know, stranded Ooh. in New York, trying to get to LA, finally got to LA at four in the morning. I roll up to the enterprise car rental. And like some sort of bizarre coincidence, kismet, whatever you want to call it, there was two kind of like, you know, uh, GameStop looking employees uh, (laughs) that were behind the counter at the uh, at the Enterprise Rental and they were hitting on one another, one girl, one guy and they're it's like four in the morning it's like four in the morning and they're talking about yo what's your top three favorite movies of all time no you know i swear to god and (laughs) the girl answered with uh uh she was like breakfast club um uh what's the um inception was number two but number one, baby, natural born killers, you know, and, and, wow. and, you know, she had like, you know, the nose rings and the, you know, the whole yeah. sort of dark anime the vibes. Glow, uh, yeah. Jason. Right. <laughs> and it was like, wow, still 30 years later. I mean, this yeah, is the 30th yeah, anniversary. It's, it's totemic wow. for a type as, as, it as Marcus is also saying. Love My it. thing is related in a way. Um, okay. In another life gang, I was a strip club DJ <laughs> for years. This <laughs> I is was. real. And I was damn I this was damn real. good. I was yeah, yeah. I was the head DJ, yo, at uh, the New Century Theater in San Francisco. So was that so like, right? Just just real quick, was that like okay, everybody, get ready for Kimberly? Ooch, ooch. Yeah, exactly. Like, all right, guys, coming up next, we got this sensational uh, Cindy. <laughs> Give her some love, gents. You I know, love some that. shit. Yeah. Amazing. Anyway, so it's it's so it's three songs. And the first one's supposed to be like, here I am, fellas, you know, and uh, and the middle one is like the middle one, but the, the, the last song is the slow one. So what I'm saying is there were, um, and I was just, uh, I, I had to get a f- small core s- collection of CDs oh, yeah. that were like absolutely going to be in demand. And it was TLC and Pulp Fiction soundtrack, actually, mm-hmm. and a bunch of other shit. And uh, this one. Yeah. And a lot of girls would use it just and do like Sweet Jane for their last song. Of course. And like, Sweet Jane. All the girls loved this soundtrack, yeah. but the ones who kind of were antagonistic and hated the audience played, You're on my shit list. You know, <laughs> yeah, the right, first yeah. one. <laughs> That was Elsa. very big, <laughs> right? And and if they were really obnoxious and the girls were just totally like didn't give AF, they'd put on Fork Boy. 
oh. by lard. Which is this weird, Jesus. deep, aggressive, deep cut by this Jello Biafra side project. Oh. So, so I know that soundtrack upside down and backwards. All the slow wow. songs and all the obnoxious songs. And, yeah. Um, it's good times. Good times. Yeah, good I times. Had a There's a Bob nice. Dylan song on it. And all the comments on YouTube were like, is there any way I can get this without the dialogue from the movie over the top of it? Because I guess the CD was doing the Pulp Fiction, the uh, Reservoir oh, yeah. Dogs type thing where yeah, they've got the, dialogue the from the movie. In and out, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so that's my anecdote. Uh, Amazing. Indelible. Amazing. For me, Memories. just, you know, this movie was introduced to me actually in a film class. Um, my first ever film class wow. I took when I was 15 years old uh, uh, in a summer program, and the teacher showed the the which we'll get into. Let's not get into it here, but uh, the absolutely atrocious diner opening diner scene where and he's uh, like, "This is how you don't make a film." No, no, it was no? like oh, okay. it was like the stylistic flourishes of the you know slow motion, you know silent movie. Did you uh, go to film throwing. school in Florida? <laughs> this was an LA man and it was you know mm. it was it was brutal. Um, that does sound kind of film teachery. It's to so me, film teacher. Oh, I totally. Totally. <laughs> so um all right. Well let's let's get into this um and just kind of take a couple steps back in terms of how this project came together because there's obviously a Quentin Tarantino component to all of this. So the way that this started out is Quentin Tarantino had written the script for Natural Born Killers, and it was very different. Um, it, it, it didn't focus so much on the Mickey and Mallory sort of Bonnie and Clyde concept as it did actually the um, Robert Downey Jr. character, the actual person who is the tabloid, exploitive, you know, uh, ambulance chaser kind of character. That was sort of the, the main thrust of the story. Um, hmm. But anyway... So he had written the script and he had promised his friend Rand Vossler, a fellow clerk at the you know video archives that he worked there, that he was going to direct the film. And the mm -hmm. pair uh, could not find funding for it. So um, uh, basically they, 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 they decided they would shoot it guerrilla style without permits on the streets of L.A. on black and white 16 millimeter film stock. Mm -hmm. And, you know, shortly before they went into production, Oliver Stone gets uh, a, a copy of the script and wanted to buy it for ten thousand dollars as his next pro as his next project, and he had just come off of doing you know JFK and Heaven and Earth, and he was looking for some he was literally looking to make like a big blockbuster action film. That's what he wanted to make, and he thought that this script could be that. <laughs> okay, obviously this movie took a different turn in that process, but. Yeah. Um, you know, Rand. Well, it sounds like just not to interrupt, but just it's you know, not film. Man bites dog. Yes. It, yeah. It sounds like that's what the project tonally was going to be like. That Tarantino and his sure. partner were going to do right More closely. Which is, the, yeah, which is very sort of satirical about you know, in, in with a much better POV about you know violence and society and things like that. Media um, yeah. and media, and so um, in exchange, you know, for uh, giving up his directorial debut, you know, Rand is you know credited as a co-producer on this film mm. so um interestingly enough um i know like we like to cite weird ephemera here on the show so quentin claimed that his initial inspiration for the film came from uh, came after reading the highly controversial magazine answer me do you guys know what that is oh wow yeah yeah, yeah. jim goad right? yeah that's right oh yeah, yeah him right oh, yeah. so it's notorious even back then sort that's of a right portland type uh i remember mm. he was in portland like djing country western oh, stuff. i don't know about that no it yeah. was like very uh gavin mcginnis yes. in the 90s kind of uh it's edgelord 90s. edgelord mm -hmm. that's right and it was, was a proto manifesto Red is that what yeah it? exactly yeah that's right and it was a husband and wife team this this sort of they were very controversial jim and debbie gold uh, that they sort of blurred the lines between satire and reality, and they they you know created issues like hate, the hate issue, the rape issue, and the murder issue, and so yeah. that's what sort of sparked the idea. Um, it is the quintessential cringe, uh, embarrassing uh, yeah. Gen X tone. Right. You know, totally. like, look at my, I just got a John Wayne Gacy portrait. Man, yeah. <laughs> framed it, you know, it's like, oh, shut up. Right. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And so, um, uh, and this is in Oliver Stone's own words here is, uh, he said, when Tarantino wrote these two characters, Mickey and Mallory, they were originally based on, I guess, 
Bonnie and Clyde, but he basically wrote a different movie than the one I made. He wrote a very nice, clever take takeoff on an AIP picture with a 90s wryness. It was mostly about the TV journalist, and Mickey and Mallory were just sort of crazy stick figures. It was a clever script, wow. but he didn't want to do it, so he moved on to do Reservoir Dogs. I think he was hurt that I rewrote it so much, but I told him that I can't really make what he, a 26-year-old, would make as a first film. Uh, as a 47-year-old filmmaker, it didn't interest me. I wanted another level of socio-political comment, and I want to deal with the whole justice system. I want to deal with the killers. Where do they come from? Who are their parents are? Quentin, hadn't, Quentin hasn't seen the movie, so who knows what he'll say. This is shortly before the film was released. And... As we said before, before he disowns it. Yeah, right. right. Which he did, of course, which he did famously. And this, of course, is 1994. So you have the Menendez brothers, O.J. Simpson, Tanya Harding, the Rodney King incident, Waco, all these things sort of, you know, uh, that Stone felt that the media was heavily involved in the outcome of these uh, stories. And he wanted to sort of uh, imbue this. Um, sort of criticism, satire of the media and their responsibility uh, in, in, in violence in our society. and sort Tabloid of. Babylon. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. Which is another really stale, old, 30-year-old thing, too, which we can probably get into later because that really is the core of the film. A lot of people think this is sort of like like a serial killer, like sexy, like psycho poet murderer movie, but it really is at its heart which I was reminded of watching it again, is that it is a, is, is a screed against uh, mass media, mm -hmm. which is so boring. And it's so dated, funny enough, because we're in a different media landscape now. I'm yeah. not saying it's better, but it's different, right. you know? Mm -hmm. So it's sort of very, qu it's quaint, mm -hmm. you know, it's concerns from three decades ago. Do you guys know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, totally. And, you know, something that was evident to me watching it, I, I, unfortunately for a second time for this fucking show, um, never again. Never I'm again. Get a tattoo. Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> never again. Never again. <laughs> is is like you know the choice to shift the perspective to the Mickey and Mallory characters, you know, and and watching the excessive violence and everything that they're you know portraying, it's it's not landing the sort of message that I think mm -hmm. Oliver Stone wants to make because. It's yeah. it because the I, because the concept of the media itself, the 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 Robert Downey Jr. character is so in the background, he doesn't come in even mm -hmm. until I mean he's there a little bit, but he doesn't really no, become a prominent he's part. Really, of the, the film. second half. Yeah, the know. second half, and so it's like that point is already lost by the point that that comes up, and so it's 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 weird because it's such a cynical move. I think this film to basically say that you know everything that's happening in the media right now, it's like well millions of idiots out there are going to watch this and they're going to take it in the wrong way, you know, but mm -hmm. it's ironic because that's what exactly what would happen to this yeah. movie. Yeah, I know. It's, it's hard to make a commentary about the ugly brutality of modern media and criticize it with a piece of ugly brutality. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's like, it's, it's, it's a, one of the, it's a dumb guy trap mm -hmm. where it's like you are making the thing yeah. that has no distance Mm -hmm. from what you're critiquing like mm -hmm. there's no it's 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 what i'm saying is it's titillating and it's sexy and it's cut like a shitty music video yep and it's like you know like shoot the gun fucking head cue hard rock guitar <laughs> and it's like what 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 is anyone supposed to make of that right other than just it's another example of tacky i know ugly violent porn Right. You shouldn't do what? dumb. <laughs> like, like, don't do dumb on dumb, you know? Like, exactly. this is dumb on Thank dumb. You, right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it feels like Rob Zombie kind of type film, like a proto-Rob Zombie type film, right? And then it appeals to the same people that like those movies. Oh, right? yeah. And then, you know, apparently, I haven't been able to confirm this, but the wiki says that it was like, had inspired copycat crimes and stuff like that. It did. So it's like, it did. It did. I mean, what, what kind of a commentary are you making? No, if it did. Like, you know. It did. It, it, there, yeah, it totally, it totally glorifies violence. And then, you know, I saw like Robert Oliver Stone's always saying like, you know, people talked about how violent the movie was, but they never comment on any of the other themes. And it's because, you know, it's, it's, it's so buried underneath the violence, even the posters like, you know, um, well, I guess, sorry, the, the poster is like having to drive home 
it's trying to do some work to drive home the theme because it gets so lost in the movie. Right. Even the poster has to be like a bold new film that takes a look at a country seduced by fame, obsessed by crime and consumed by the media. Yeah. It's like when you have to put the fucking theme (laughs) of the movie on the poster, (laughs) you know, you've got like a problem with like the, the message delivery system. I mean, there's so many problems with this film and I think maybe we should look at this as like two pieces. There's like we were saying before, like philosophically, the fallacies and the, and the faults of this film. And I guess we're doing that right now. And then we can talk about sort of the technique. The execution is poorly done. But one of the things that crossed my mind was like, like uh, this is bad r- filmmaking. This is bad creativity. But like there's this fitful attempt to um, have a, a backstory for the girl and to have like a rationale for her violence. You know, oh, she's, she's sexually abused by yep. her father. Mm-hmm. Right. So and, and there's a, what I'm saying is like a one for one correlation. She's killing all these really gross men who are coming on to her and she's ending their lives because they're basically another grotesque, sickening version of her sexist, you know, pig father. So what I'm saying is that's like, okay, I could follow that trail of thought. And what I'm getting at is my point is that has nothing to do with the media like her, her, her cross to bear is PTSD of a traumatic childhood. Right. Right. And she's exercising a revenge against it. When does a TV come into that? Yeah. It doesn't. Right. So it's like, so it's already, it just collapses immediately because he's trying to give her a backstory. Also, she gets one, uh, but then the guy doesn't. Uh, you know, what's right. his name? Um, the, the meat he gets nothing. It's just, guy. It just cuts to his dad for a second and goes like, are you bleeding fight? And it's like, and there's this very faint implication of like, there's a class thing that he's actually like, He's got a chip on his shoulder because he's smarter than all the rich college boys. And he's like a blue collar philosopher. And that's a classic horseshit corny thing. But that doesn't also have anything to do with the media. Yeah. Right. What I'm saying is they don't illustrate these two characters being raised on television. Kind of more like Cable Guy. Ooh, <laughs> shout out. Cable Guy. Shout out. Cable Guy does a better job in sure. saying that Jim Carrey's character was raised by television. Yeah. They explicitly mm-hmm. show it. There's these flashbacks, and it's like, mom, yeah. mom will be back later. Watch TV, and so what I'm saying is, there ma- are there maladies. These two characters created from television, right? If that's what you're uh, rail, he's he's <clears throat> it's a screed against that. I know this, this doesn't make any sense. And oh, instead, yeah. <clears throat> and instead that there's like there's this pastiche of like a all in the family sitcom, you know, and that's mm-hmm. the correlation of the TV, which is very random and weird and doesn't really play into the overall message of violence in the media. But real quick, just Mm -hmm. to put a button on what Marcus was saying is you were sort of talking about, you know, uh, it's just like, you know, that, that this inspired, you know, copycats, you know, this, that's kind of the irony of it. Is it, 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 there was a huge court case involving one person that killed their partner, you know, and blamed this movie for it. And it went to trial famously the Columbine killers, you know, would reference NBK all the time. You know, the, the oh, whole, the whole idea, they call their operation, they call, right? they, they called their whole school shooting operation NBK, you know, oh, so this Jesus. was appealing to all this stuff. And it's, it's kind that's of wild too, because that's like the first big school shooting mm-hmm. and it's associated with this film. Yeah. And it's so, you know, it's just, you know, it, it gives, it, there's this miss. You could re- take a reading of this film that inspired all this horrible shit that came after it. You know what I mean? Like I it really, I mean, I know I don't really subscribe to that. I don't the either. Theory of like media and yeah. film, but like you totally could. You could. draw a connection there. You could. And he's not. That's not what he intended. I guess. Right you now. And so just to go and that's back- getting to what we're saying, where it's like he has this whole philosophy, right? And it collapses in the execution mm-hmm. narratively. Right. right. I'm just yeah. saying narratively. Right. Right. And right. Um, and then and all that and look look at all the consequences and it's not worth it because it was a garbled message in the first place. Right? Totally. And yeah, I mean, we're supposed to feel like the media is like egging them on or something, but we don't see them react to themselves on TV. You know, we don't see them see themselves on TV and then and carry out the crimes. You know, we have this like really ham fisted thing where we have interviews with people and they're like. Yeah, they're doing that kind of a Manson I know. thing, I know. right? The I know. Mickey I know. Mallory are the coolest. I get so sick of hearing their names too. Mickey I Mallory, I okay. hate that. <laughs> Hold but, on. Uh, I hate their names. I Hold hate on. their names. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, it's like you see it so much. Just you know, people uh, people are saying you know that's what you're. That's the only indication of like besides Robert Downey Jr. of the me- of their sensational media thing yes. is just a few people. Going, so, they're so cool, right? But, like right, man on the street really connect interviews. To the yeah, right. and it's all Gen X kids who are like, 
he's like he's like cooler than like elvis man it's like yeah right is so trite <laughs> and 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 so just to put a bow on what i'm saying is I, I i think it's really misguided to make the perspective of the movie like we're following these mickey and mallory characters um instead <laughs> of i know instead of um you know really investing in what could have been this sort of interesting television producer, you know, whose career, you know, mm. you know, making his career around the exploitation of these crimes and how that plays into, you know, the 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 business around all of this. I think that would have been much more interesting. But the thing mm. is that Oliver Stone himself has gone on record sort of saying that in, in switching the perspective in his script, he wanted to, quote, put the audience in the driver's seat, make them the killers virtual mm -hmm. reality goggles, so to speak, where you would participate and enjoy the ride, end quote. Um, and something I found Why? to be... I, <laughs> I don't know. But something I found to be... Well, I think that, you know, and that's what, you know, is irresponsible, I think, of the movie. But one thing he yeah. also commented on, which, again, just is so fucking cynical and shows how he doesn't understand satire and he doesn't mm -hmm. understand how this works, is he would... He kept... He kept slamming Beavis and Butthead in these interviews. Yeah, I saw where, where, yeah. where he would say, "Well, you know, now now everything's just Beavis and Butthead," you know, and it's like, dude, Beavis okay. and Butthead, which is, is so like much more smarter than this film, yes, which right. is which is subtly witty, <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, I know. And well constructed. I know, I know, and okay. and actual satire, right? Of like, you know, yeah, what's happening in the American South, you know, and today, and it's 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 sure. wild. So there's so many. Right. It's just, it's literally well, that's a, watching. That's a boomer yeah. looking at like, yeah. and like, and not getting it essentially. Exactly. You know? exactly. Right. There's a little bit of that. Like he's like, like back in the sixties, we knew what was up. You nineties kids need to listen to us because we have some wisdom to pass down. Right. You know? Yeah. Right. right. Uh, exactly. And he tried to deliver it in satire, but it's such a fail, you know, that's like, a satire. Read... Oh, I guess. Well, he's is. trying to, yeah. this is, he refers to it oh. repeatedly as a satire. He Tommy does. Lee Jones is talking about it being like Moliere. Like, you know, like uh, they really had an inflated uh, idea about what this was supposed to be. And there's there's a great quote from Oliver in the, you know, some of the behind the scenes, which I suffered through watching. But um, this one is so revealing. Like he's like, uh, I, it's almost like a confessional thing. Like, like he's confess like he knows the type of movie he made and he's like accidentally confessing to it because he's, he's saying uh, <laughs> there's no question that movies by the standards of real violence are are almost a joke he's saying that like a movies are a joke compared to like the way movies are, or violence is depicted in films is basically yeah, a joke uh -huh. is a lot of the younger filmmakers can't get the realism so they go the other way <laughs> you kill someone and it's fun it's hip it's cool he turns into like a, you know dr evil for a second and he, says, <laughs> and he goes i could never take part in that you know it's so funny like oh that's so backwards basically like that's what this is reporting yeah. yeah no i know yeah yeah he's 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 got a very skewed perspective on this film and, and himself if he's saying something like that you yes know? what he's saying is like oh it's played for laughs the ear getting cut off and like reservoir dogs or yeah something like that yeah right totally Totally. And and it's it's it, you know, now okay, so it's bad because it's misguided and stupid and flimsy and shallow. And shallow. Of, of course, mm -hmm. it is. And uh, yes. and and morally bankrupt as we were saying <laughs> yeah. because it caused so much damage and it wasn't worth it because yeah. it, right? It didn't even know what it was trying to say. It's not smart, didn't know what it was trying to say. Then you also compound that with just really cringe filmmaking. Super super cringe. And 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 just like again, I go back to being shallow. It's like, you know, it, this is the movie where you're seeing literally the words projected on the actor, saying, you know, too much TV and demon, you know, is projected onto their bodies into this film. You're 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 actually which seeing... could work, but but see, that's the thing. It's all these techniques that could work in a three minute music video, by like yes. REM or something. Totally, you know, yes. like but 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 he's using it, and uh, and he's doing too much of it. And the movie never, it, the movie's all up here, and mm -hmm. it never settles down for a no. second. So you don't get any characterizations, you don't get any pacing, and it's just aggressive uh, aesthetic attitude. And you're always in danger with aesthetics to 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 have these really ugly, um, dated looks. Yeah. And, and Marcus helped me out here, like <laughs> like these flash cuts to like these demons, and there's like all this yeah. like gel colors, you know. It's and, like yeah, yeah. There's uh, it's it's like kitchen sink aesthetics. Yeah, you know, it's like everything in the book. Yeah, the gels, the Dutch angles, oh, all the, the different angles. textures. You know, like every 
in that opening bar thing, every shot oh, is God. dutched. You know, uh, every like, shot. So trying to do like Hong overlook. Kong. I guess it was trying to do like Hong Kong or something. You know, like yeah, that. you're right. And it cuts to cartoons. And how about this? You can't have people have a window a in the cartoon, hotel room. Yeah. It has to be like a uh, Wild projection. West 30s cartoon, you know, like uh, Wild West cowboys. Right. Like, right. Just fucking chill out for a second. All right. I think some some of that like seems to have come not to forgive it, you know, but I think like some of that came from like the production design or something. They're like, well, if we're going to shoot landscapes, why don't we shoot landscapes of the mind, Oliver? And he's like, great, show it to me. You know, so they cut <laughs> together those kind of things, you know, and, and I think all that I, I didn't realize it until watching the behind the scenes, but he has an intentionality with the textures and all the different film, you know, uh, things that you see, but. It, it didn't come. It doesn't come across. I don't think. But I think he was trying to have like different points of view, like yes. represented through the yep. textures. Like, yep. what do you mean? The um, the the TV interviewer guy is got kind of like it's always like a kind of a video texture, you know, TV texture. Oh, okay. And then Tommy Lee Jones has a specific kind of like grainy, like sixteen, like super sixteen texture or something, you know. Because he's a Mickey warden? and Mallory is supposed to be all green and like on drugs. And snake right, bite, and you're right, supposed to be right. like feeling that world and of sick. that, you know. So there yeah. was some intentionality there, but to but me, also, it just I feels think, like a mess. You know, and I think cutting cutting away to old cowboy movies is sort of like you know, like they live in a fantasy of right. media of old movies, right, and right, right, TV right. and right. stuff like that. I have something really cringy okay. uh, on what you just said, Marcus. Uh, <laughs> Oliver Stone calls the frequent cuts to black and white where dialogue is often repeated with a slightly different intonation, vertical cutting, quote unquote. <laughs> Stone explains that the idea behind the technique is to create an outer moment, the color footage, and an inner moment, the black and white footage at the same time. Cringe. So there's wow, that. I know. Fail. That's Look, the total th fail. That could, you know, that could be in the hands of Godard or something like that. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about the execution here you know yeah. he's probably he's probably a big weed head or something like that yeah also oh, yeah. by the way can i, I just want to i want to make sure we are still contextualizing where he is in this career sure he's a can he's at a can do anything moment still so we've got uh jfk he also did the doors yeah shout was out one of our favorites shout out our episode right, classic doors. so we did in the archives but, but yeah. what i'm saying is like he was still up to this film and no more he was hot. He was he could do anything he wanted blank check from the studio time. Yep. And he also was getting a lot of probably yes men. Mm -hmm. So this was him at his just about peak of like, no yes. one can touch me. No one can talk to me. I'm not going to get a roadblock by anything. No one's going to second guess me. And this is him just completely going all out with mm -hmm. no um, with no guardrails, basically, you know, no restraint, no taste. You know, no. yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> and and also, I think, again, just to put a bow on the you know, failed philosophy of this movie before we get into the set pieces maybe we can talk about is mm -hmm. I think what makes, I think what's so frustrating about this movie and, 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 and makes it something I hate is anything where you are examining this, these sort of themes, you know, uh, and you have these anti-hero characters and he's intentionally making us, you know, uh, root for them and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, sort of get behind them. But then at the same time... There are time, heroes. There are heroes. But then at the same time, you're going to come back and you're going to say, well, look, you're complicit in this too for watching this movie. You know, and that's the statement that you're making, you know? Right. Uh, and it's yes. just so... I think that's well, what he's trying to say. No, I. you're right. But it's so muddled because of the... Um, the, the, there's so much messaging that's conflicting with itself, but also the execution is so loud and obnoxious and gets in its own way too, as we're going to yeah. talk about the technique. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had one observation just as we move on from this chunk about like uh, the soul of the film, that's what sure. I'm trying to call it, <laughs> is um, I was noticing Soulless. something in this viewing where it's not class quite, but it's just sort of like a victim and perpetrator. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. So there are heroes, and yes, they do kill innocent people. And she, remember before I was saying, she has sort of a weird justification. He kind of does too, because he's like a working class chimney the shoulder guy. But what I'm saying is all the victims, and or, or let's put it this way, all the people who aren't Mickey and Mallory, <laughs> are, um, <laughs> are whatever their names are, are um, they're all awful people. And they're all kind of redneck and like the yep. guys are like sex abusers and like pretty right. close to being obviously racist, like. The cops. cops, yeah, exactly, and they're mean, and they're like, "Well, fuck you too." And of course, that uh, Sizemore character oh. is like a total lech, and he's a rapist, and he should be. Of course, he should get stabbed in the throat. Fuck him. So yeah. what I'm saying is, it's such an ugly, dark thing where it's like, 
Like, yeah. who do you identify with? You're forced to identify with Mickey and Mallory because they're the they're the most humanized people. Right. And it's a setup because every the film is otherwise populated by shitty people. Like everyone, for, like in the in the, in the cafe in the beginning, he's like, "I'm gonna get a piece of that ass." Okay, you know, all and, right, and, we got to talk right? about this. No, I know we're gonna transition. But then, no, but, then yeah. like, but then it's like, no, but then the woman, the waitress who gets killed, is just like a piece of shit, dumb, nose picking, fat ass, white trash, <laughs> Waffle House chick. And it's right. like maybe maybe one of the murder victims is like a nice person or just like is right. teaching. Well, they kid, have like, someone like tied up in their room too. Yeah, it's really hard to feel like, am I supposed to root for them? And it's really hard to get on their side. And I think that was part of his intention was like, you know, I think he was looking at cases like the Menendez brothers and thinking like, well, they were basically people and and something made them, you know, what makes a criminal right? Uh, a criminal? They have like a hard life and that leads them to this point. So I think that was part of his intention, showing like her backstory and trying to give them some sort of connection of love at the end. You know, it was, it was trying sure. to show that they are people, but then it's just so it doesn't work because of just the how big the performances well, are i think it does work is, you know? i think he succeeds in having it be the film essentially be in a way a love story of two our two heroes mm-hmm. all i'm saying is always watch out for what the victims are in these movies yeah and yeah. these victims right. are only depicted as grotesque shithead american tv watching people who kind of deserve to die yeah and mm-hmm. they're the thing they're the population that gives us this shitty satanic culture because yeah. they feed into they it and they watch it. these shows. Yeah. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. So why not fucking cut their stupid pig American throats? <laughs> right, right. It's very gross. And it's very yeah. old boomer. Like he was a revolutionary <laughs> kind of like he was what he is is like he's like a white collared rich kid who got disgruntled by going to Vietnam and he mm-hmm. got really into like almost like radical bombing places, politics of yeah. the late 60s. He's like a smash the state guy. Yeah. But what he, what people like that do is they abstract the general population and no one is teaching their kid homework or like working a double yeah. shift to help their kid go to college. They're all just pieces of shit. Yeah. They're awful house people. So let's <laughs> mow them down. It's ugly. <laughs> Fuck but, you, all right. this stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. And uh, it, it's, oh my God. All right. So let's talk about this opening diner scene. We've mentioned it a few times. Speaking it's, of- it's literally the showstopper moment, and 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 it really was for Quentin Tarantino too, because uh, rumor legend has it that um, as Quentin Tarantino watched the opening scene with Mickey and Mallory in the diner, <laughs> that's when he immediately demanded his name be removed from the credits. Dude, like he's in the lobby, like on a cell phone, like like minute payphone. five. Yeah, right. Right, right. Yeah. Dude, like minute five, like yeah. in the payphone. Yeah, I mean, think about Ooh. that. Think think about no, watching, I get it. like what you had in mind. You know, with all these references. You know, Bonnie and Clyde, whatever, you know, you're going to make a gritty 16 millimeter film with your friends. And then you see that you just see out of touch. Mm. It would be like watching like uh, reality bites or something. It'd be watching like, you know, like mm. when the sort of Hollywood engine commodifies your oh, I know what kind you're of saying. vision. You're you saying know? The, the TV pilot in reality yeah. bites. Right. That's being destroyed by the corporate boyfriend. Right. Mm. Deep cut. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> ninety four, right? 94. Yeah, or somewhere in there. It's great. It's uh, it's a good movie. Yeah, um, I love reality bites. Yeah, totally. So okay, so we're opening with like, oh, this is the point I was gonna make. Fuck, I almost forgot it. The point I was gonna make is if you wanted to, you know, m- properly examine this story and you know how violence in the media and how things perpetuate, and you wanted to have the satire and you wanted to have nail that stuff, you would probably just actually make the making of natural born killers as a movie, you know, and nice. Oliver Stone being your, I know exactly what you're talking about, right. you know, like a weird French art film. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. no, totally. That is, you're right. That's where then he would have hit the mark, but he didn't have that sort of, you know, uh, self-awareness. Anyway, <laughs> no, okay. he doesn't have layers like that. No, yeah. no, no, no way. So, okay. Opening diner scene, Marcus alluded to the the uh, o- only Dutch angles we're seeing in this opening, which are just painful to watch. Um, and then, of course, you're seeing that repetition with the black and white cutaways, the, the sort of whatever I said, vertical cutting I was mentioning. And that's to me was is 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 is, is, is a holdover from JFK. And man, mm. have you ever tried to watch JFK recently? Anyone? No. 
It's kidding? fucking hard to watch that movie. I that did. movie three is, hours, right? It's painful, dude. And a lot of people are going to be. It's upset really hard. I, to, I remember it was really hard to follow just to understand. Like dude. you have to have devoted a big chunk of your life to the JFK conspiracy theories to actually kind of like it's just really understand what the hell's going on. Boring. Yeah. And a lot of people are going to be mad at that. They're going to be mad. I said that because that people do like JFK, but the, the, the like the stylistic holdovers from JFK. You have that. The black and white, mm-hmm. you know, sort of repetition, mm-hmm. and then you also have Marcus, this um, soft, almost star filter that's being used on everything, where like the highlights uh, of uh, of everything is just so painful. Like, what is Pro-mist, he doing? I think. Like, yeah, I like it looks like Soundgarden Pro Mist or something. Video, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like the right. highlights and everything are so brutally '90s. It's so insufferable. I just want to give a shout out to the busy editing. Yep. That that always yeah. gets me. It's the fitful editing. Oh, it's horrible. All the music cues, you know, it's got Leonard say, Cohen and the fake cramps and Patty Smith and Velvet yeah. Underground covers and sitcom music and African High Life, Patsy Cline and Reggae and all kinds of you yeah. know yeah. Nine Inch Nails, of course. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And but then in this diner scene, it's just like all the characters are stupid, including our protagonists. Mm-hmm. Like, just like I was saying. stupid. <laughs> and and you know that Tarantino that probably is what pissed him off the most because he wouldn't oh. be writing like even his anti-hero characters are cool characters. They're, they're characters that he likes and cares right. about and would fall in love with and probably seeing like just these dumb fucking characters that yeah. you know, are made so cynically in this movie. These grotesque right. depictions of average Americans. And the, they're the like leads. dumber and than the, the than the redneck guys in Dumb and Dumber that are like, kick his ass, see bad. Is that what it, like those kind of redneck yeah. guys at the diner was always kind of a trope yeah. in 90s oh, movies, see. you know? Right, right, right. But also Mickey and Mallory, like those two characters are also, you know, just so dumb, you know? And I think <laughs> yeah, yeah. him seeing that, he was probably very offended by. And w- when those right. sleazy cowboy guys come in, it gets so trauma. It's like full on trauma. Like, I'm going to mm-hmm. book your wow. fucking booking, you know? Yeah. And then it's just so bad. And then, of course. And then, like, you, it's also like uh, shades of proto Rob Zombie, like we're saying. There's a, yeah, whole, yeah. There's a whole culture. It is a whole Rob Zombie. Mountain of shit. And this yeah. is on it, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. This film, yeah. especially yeah. this scene. Totally. Yeah, this walked so Rob could run for sure. Exactly. That's what I'm <laughs> yeah. saying. Yeah, Rob yes. is running. Yeah, uh, dreadlocks dangling <laughs> for sure. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so anyway, and then of course we get into the sitcom satire. Rodney Dangerfield, you know, plays no. her, her dad. Uh, uh, I'm going to have some the thoughts most on that later. Heavy handed oh, like, sitcom thing. I mean, a heavy handed satire of all time, you know? Totally. And he, uh, from what I understand, <clears throat> had no idea what he signed up for. <laughs> and oh, I was hoping that when and, I was watching and, his performance. And 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 he he basically went into this like, you want me to do what? You know? And he didn't understand like the tone and what it was going to be used for. Um, right. That's my understanding of it. That, like, why uh, is my head dunking underwater? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For five minutes. <laughs> but just the way that it was being portrayed. Yeah, I know, and, I know. I, I love that. That's interesting. He didn't hear the laugh track, for instance. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And 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 also it's just so weird that the first half of the movie, again, purely as a narrative, as a film, it's just vignettes. It's mm-hmm. it's literally just short film vignettes almost, uh, that are yeah. either satirizing or parodying something else. There's no real you know, and I know this is just so surface level to say, but there's no like real character development. You know, we're not really, no. you know, like from one from one part of the film, you know, they're madly in love. Mickey and Mallory, they're in love, and then they uh, all of a sudden are fighting. You know, the next scene, and they hate each other, and you know, there's no yeah, <laughs> like yeah, yeah. well, she she runs off for a little while, and yeah, and it's wears like a blonde wig and all that stuff. Yeah. But it, but it, but it, but but like you're saying, it's like it all just so empty and, and so and not in context with anything that it's just like basically looking at colors and shapes moving around. Yeah. It's like and and but he's especially in what again I, I've talked about this before, but it's just like she is. They're trying to give her some coloring, some shading. Yeah, some fleshing out, and but he is just an enigma, and I find that gravely uninteresting. You know what I mean? Do you want to talk about the Native American scene, though? Sure, go. You know, because yeah. um, I mean, we're we're gonna have a little fun at the end here with a little surprise thing that 
we're all going to do. Sure. But uh, what I'm saying now is I'm not picking this as anything of, of a scene that approaches anything of quality. Mm-hmm. But I will say that the scene in the um, – if this was a better film and he had better luck – you know, and fought against himself. Yeah. The scenes with the native Americans could have been a better, could have, could, it could have been the center of the film and it could have, what am I trying to say? There's a possibly good film in that part of the film. Okay. Mm-hmm. And you know, back to the native American stuff, like in the doors, you know, the naked Indian stuff, you know, and he loves <laughs> right. all that kind of thing. And that's a, that's a great boomer thing to cut to. It's always sure. like the, the, the soul it's it's right. the insulted soul of real america is in the form of of the like an old wise native american person sure, and yeah. he's in this film and you know he's saying like you are bad people bad vibes and mm-hmm. and mick mickey like like picks up on it because they're on drugs you know they're on mushrooms so he's like like what i'm saying is there's a moment for the film to kind of transcend and maybe go in a different direction like the film could have gone in a different direction where there's like some wisdom and understanding on the part of Mickey and Mallory <laughs> after this traumatic event, killing him or not, but being on drugs and like mm-hmm. some kind of transformative thing because sure. he is like, like I'm so bad. Like he's purging his soul. And he's kind of vomiting out all the ugliness of what Oliver's saying, which is this ugly soul of America in the form of television violence. Yep. And he's purging it and this native Americans cleansing him. But uh, I guess what I'm saying is it felt like the film had a chance Okay. Just wondering what you guys are thinking. Right. No, I mean, I, I, I identify what you're saying. And like when there's, there's parts of the film that I wish, I mean, I think his intention, the movie he wanted to make, I think I could like, I think I like the movie that is like buried yeah. in there. Yeah. But I'm disappointed just, more than anything. Yeah. It's disappointing. And I'm not saying this. I, I, I kind of like the themes that he's dancing around with and some of the setups could have worked. And, you know, and the, it is like, you know, when I hear him talk about this scene, he says like, you know, that they, uh, this is a turning point in the film, which it is. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they kill somebody that he feels uh, <laughs> that she feels bad for killing him. You know, and it, yep. and that's they end up kind of like uh, setting themselves up to where they end up getting arrested because she feels yeah. bad. You know, but then they could they have also go gotten arrested. They get separated, the and that. they and they you know, and he and he learns to like be without her. And he realizes that that's when he becomes a philosopher in prison. And they fall. He realizes he needs to be with her, and like love is the answer. You know, and like. And that that's how they escape the violent cycles by being together. Yeah. You know, there, there's like some ideas, you know, yeah. in this film that that could have been really cool. I think it's just the uh, ruined by the style and all the bad choices. You know, yeah. well, of course, no, but also just let's stick with the narrative for one second because there's there's like a chance that this film could have had right at the Native American scene and it loses its grip is what I'm saying because. The, in the narrative, strictly speaking in the narrative, yeah. they kill him. They don't really mean to kill the Native American w- w- wisdom guy. But then they are, they're still on drugs. And they're like, oh, we need an anecdote. We got bit by a snake. And so they go into the uh, pharmacy. Yep. I kind of like, the by the way, the visual aesthetic of the pharmacy. Mm-hmm. Like the, all like the big, fluorescent yeah. light and all generic uh, uh, packaging. That's kind of cool. Yeah. What I'm saying is narratively it disappears because they could have been on drugs and been in trouble and gotten r- arrested without – there's no consequence of the killing of the native American guy to them getting busted by fucking up in the pharmacy. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it doesn't actually, there's like a step that there's no direct correlation. Like they didn't have like this aha moment and stay in the desert and sort of transform, you know, it'd be sort of like, like how Holy or no, a topo is in two parts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what yep. I'm saying, guys? Yep. Yeah, like first, yeah, That could have been interesting. Like, like El Topo completely changes in the middle because like he the essentially rebirth. dies. He has like a yeah. rebirth. Like his kind ego of thing. Dies. Sorry. Yeah, he has like a yeah, he has like an ego rebirth kind of thing. Thank you. And it yeah. doesn't really happen. He just gets arrested because they fucked up, and they also killed an innocent pharmacist guy. Right. So that's just anyway. They, I think they lost the grip. He lost that totally. chance that film could have had to go somewhere different. Can we talk just really quickly, uh, as I'm staring at the clock, just about the casting of the film, you know, uh, about Woody um, as Mickey? Um, Perfect choice. (laughs) No, I'm kidding. (laughs) I have many problems. I know. Well, it's it's, it's interesting because Woody Harrelson at that time, you know, he was essentially only known for Cheers uh, at that Mm -hmm. point, right? I mean, that's really... And people thought he was kind of dumb for leaving Cheers at the time. I right. remember that too, because Shelley Long, anyone that left Cheers, was like a hit show, and it was kind of like, "Are you sure?" You know, and Cheers Curse. Yeah, yeah. and then well, he, the only other movie he did was White Men Can't Jump, right? Which I love. 
Yep. And, uh, and, you know, Stan, one of Stanley Kubrick's favorites. Um, but he also, you know, so he's looking at him as probably like a TV sitcom guy. And so we're going to subvert that oh, image. I never thought of that. Cast him yeah. against type. And that, that's maybe something that's lost a little bit watching it 30 years later. I never thought what, of that. What, yeah. Woody, Woody always was, had that kind of hayseed quality, too. You yeah. know, like he always was right. a bit of a hick. Yeah, yeah he's, like he's like doofy. spinning that country wisdom kind of mm-hmm. drawl. Yeah, he's doofy. Yeah. He's kind of a doofy guy. And, uh, but Oliver Stone said, you know, that uh, he had the look of violence in his eyes. And, uh, I'm not you know. saying that at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, He's like, and, and then what did you do, little Johnny boy? I started whacking off. Like, yeah. <laughs> how about that? That's your favorite scene, right? Guys? Oh, terrible. <laughs> when he's telling the dirty story. Where to, he the co- the to the, uh, yeah, the, the correctional officer. The, the yeah. donut yeah. chomping cops. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> but it's. <laughs> All right. So Woody Harrelson, right? No, so okay. Woody Harrelson. I have some but thoughts. It's, Woody- no, but it is an archetype, right? I mean, this, this is a Bonnie. I mean, we just mentioned this before we started recording. Wild at Heart was literally just a few handful of years before this, which, you know, is miles better by comparison mm-hmm. in terms of doing a kind of road movie about exactly well, well and also like um to play up on the, the 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 sort of um hypnotic narcotic romanticizing of like pure america wild west open road outlaw like there's some great there's that scene when that chris isaac song plays and they're in driving in the desert at night mm-hmm. and then they meet um was it Sherilyn finn who's like a car accident mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. stunning. I and what know. I mean by that is like iconic, like, you know, yep. like root, it's that Route 66 thing that, that you know, um, Lynch really got. And of course, he's a much more considered, controlled, mature mm-hmm. filmmaker mm-hmm. and yeah. deeply gifted compared to Oliver. And but 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 what I'm saying is they are the archetypes. We're talking about like casting, like, you know, he, he, your lead guy should look like James Dean, Martin Sheen in Badlands, mm-hmm. Elvis. And that is what Nicolas Cage is doing. He is like... um handsome in a way that like you know foreign people looking at a poster would be like oh american man in las vegas and like you know he looks like he's a a gas station attendant uh you know woody harrelson in this film like he doesn't have a romantic americana poet killer vibe it it feels very miscast for me right christian slater in true romance he's like you know attractive guy sure Who's in Badlands? Is sheen uh, Sheen, martin sheen martin sheen Martin Sheen. Yeah, Sheen. yeah yeah i just said that handsome right Great. Um, no, I totally agree. And the other thing is they make Woody look more fucked up in the movie. You know, like I could almost hack it with his hair, just like the kind of crazy, you know, balding guy hair pushed back. Uh, but then they actually shave his head and he looks even worse. And it becomes <laughs> like the prototypical image of the film is him, his shaved head with those fucking tiny dude, sunglasses. Uh, dude, oh. the rest of this episode <laughs> is about the dimensions of those sunglasses. Oh, okay? Sunglasses they're, too small. <laughs> they're not covering the, 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 the exposed eyeball, much less the whole general top of the eyebrow to the bottom. Oh. It's like they're, there's no they're too far apart. And it makes your eyes apart. look more not, far apart. And it wouldn't look, fl- those glasses wouldn't look flattering on anyone, but they really don't help his cause because these little tiny circles are <laughs> lost in the sea of bald head. <laughs> Flesh. Yeah. Fuck that shit. <laughs> All right. And then you they're like, that's the whole, that's the movie yeah. poster. Oh, yeah. you know? like, <laughs> go with that. That's the, that's the lead image of this film. <laughs> you were saying, you were saying too that, or I was saying, I don't know who originally said this, but that like, it's such a Getty Lee sort of look you know yeah and, somebody and, sent that earlier. And, and it's 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 seriously yeah. it's like you know he, why is he this sort of like fuggly doofy like guy i don't i don't get is he trying to do like this is beavis and butthead again i don't know why he's god i guess going well with that no aesthetic. we were saying this earlier there is i think there is a theme here of um generally of oliver stone's derisive t- uh, feeling towards a, a typical sure. american that could be you know what mm-hmm. i mean mm-hmm. yep. and, and and he's he's, he's, he's yeah. he really he is kind of an elite he is an ivy league rich kid guy and he's probably a big snob and what i'm saying is those kind of people everybody's up here they're all educated mm-hmm. they all read chaucer in high school and stuff and then everyone else right. is a gas station attendant yeah Wow, right. isn't and, which Yale? is wild because that's the core audience for this film. You know, he's got this derisive attitude towards them, which I, I agree it does come through. But then also, these those are the people that love this movie. No, they ignore that. <laughs> they ignore the layer of derision. You know, and well, they probably yeah. have identification, like you know, like it's like a juggalo kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Like hell yeah, I'm stupid and ugly. What's up? Let's party. You know, mm-hmm. like 
<laughs> but at least those guys are they're authentic. Proud. You know, they're authentically connecting yeah. with them. You know? Yeah. No, 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 you're right. No, right. Because juggalos aren't Ivy League. Right. The, the, the insane clown posse. You know, Where are we like, going with dudes. this? <laughs> We're going everywhere. Dude, back. <laughs> juggalos no, aren't it Ivy League. ICP, okay. it matters here in this conversation. <clears throat> no, no, that's a great yeah. point that you made just now, Marcus, is that there's parody because they're on the same wavelength. Right. Mm -hmm. the, the creators of the grotesque, silly, uh, ugly America stuff. They're the creators right. and right. they're working class guys who live down the road from their fans. Right. But Oliver Stone, just the, where he's even Rob from, Zombie is like that, you know, because he was like a regular dude. I mean, sure, he's got a successful band or whatever, but it wasn't just like that. a regular kind of like skeezy no. rock and roll guy. Yeah. yeah. No, no. I'm sure he's saying like, like he's off. I'm, I'm sure he, he has rich parents who live in the Oh, <laughs> he reads totally not like that. Okay. ICP, dude, talk to fucking Shaggy Two Dope. And <laughs> okay. he's not, he is real. He is real. Okay. Okay. Hold on. Yeah, I agree. I want to get a hold of this real quick because uh, I, I do want to talk about a few things, but also just to talk about Juliet Lewis. You know, we did, we just did Cape I Fear know, I only know. a few episodes ago. It breaks my heart. And, and she really was so promising coming out of Cape Fear. And, and she can be good. She can be good. And, well, and, this, and also husbands and wives. And husbands and wives. But like we can, you know, it's it's. I think with this film, she's just not given much, you know, to, to, mm -hmm. to grab no. onto. And no. it's, 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 it, it's, she could be quite great. She also in this did movie. California around this time, I know. too, which, which she plays basically a very similar character, like a serial killer girl, white trash type yeah. character, you know? I know. So, um, oh God, the t clock is dying. And then I just want to talk about, uh, <laughs> you know, this film is bifurcated. You know, it does have the first mm -hmm. part, which is the road trip aspect. And then, and then for the second half of this movie, as a viewer, man, you are just fucking trapped oh. hardcore in this fucking prison scene where somehow Oliver Stone manages to make a prison riot scene boring and you're just you're, you're stuck there for an hour. It literally took me three days to get th through the second half. I hear of you, this brother. Movie. It's a it is a chore. Well, one thing I'll say is this: you have to be a master to to conquer uh, long scenes that are crowded with chaos. Yeah, like sure. like you have to have it. Um, you have to have either restraint to figure out like yep. what to to pull out and what to to put in the foreground and background. Yeah, because it's like to to go messy like that. And to have like you feel like there's no control of it, that's where you do become instantly bored because it becomes sort of cinematic white noise. Yeah, it's just like everyone's yelling and there's, it's like the crowded uh, frames and then fast cutting. Yeah, and it's just a loss. You can't get you can't get in there. You know, really? they really shot in a prison. You know, like those are real prisoners. Yes, and stuff. And I they're think real murderers he, and that are used in those scenes, which is. What a waste! <laughs> you know. All right, let's talk about <laughs> yeah. bad bad filmmaking, though, guys. Yeah. Like, so it's it's so painful uh, that 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 whole section of the film because it's I don't know it's 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 it does it lacks the energy of the first half, and you basically are stuck there, and that's when we're getting into the interview. It, it's so fun. It's so wild how long it takes to explore what it's trying to explore mm. in that and it's it's wild yeah, it's, well said and and then also the hamminess kind of. goes up the hamminess really goes up because yeah. my takeaway with um god I keep, tommy lee jones yeah is is so like uh i was saying like batman villain yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. like broad but even like dick tracy yeah you know it's like his hair is dandy clothing and his yeah. hair and he's mm -hmm. and he looks lost you know you can always tell an actor who doesn't really know what the hell's going on so he's just like hamming it up and he's like oh golly gee whiz let's go get that sun gun it's like what what and then right. also poor robert downey jr is doing this grotesque australian scumbag that's great give me more of that uh right. your, your hillbilliness give me that breathalyzer test vibe man you know it's just like <laughs> right. and that's that's played so belabored and i yeah. feel mm -hmm. bad for downey because he's being pulled around and he's yeah. probably on a lot of drugs i yeah. think there's a lot of cocaine involved in this, in this whole <laughs> production i'm sure it's very um, cocaine okay really quick before we get uh, to the last part of the of the episode i just want to i was plumbing as i was trying to as I, as I was suffering through the prison break se sequence I hopped onto IMDb, went through the trivia section of this movie. A couple little fun anecdotes here I thought that were that were lurking in the trivia section that you guys might enjoy. How about this one? During filming, Oliver Stone would play African tribal music at full blast on set as a way of keeping a frantic mood. <laughs> cool. Okay. Oliver wow. Stone. <clears throat> here's another one. 
Oliver Stone met with singer Tori Amos and uh, openly offered her the part of Mallory. Uh, early Ooh. in her career, she uh, had pursued, wanted to pursue acting as well as singing. She was interested until he explained he also wanted to have her sing her song, Me and a Gun, play during each scene where Mallory kills someone. And that song is a complete account of her real life rape that she suffered. And so in oh, response, Jesus Christ. in response, Tori Amos slapped Oliver Stone across the face and stormed out. Oh, right. Shit. Yeah. Yeah. And wow. l- last one, because we're bleeding out of time here, but this is my own trivia. Tom, did you notice the Sex in the City cameo in this? Yes. Uh, one of the, <laughs> can- the behind the scenes technicians is... Harry. Yes. Uh, Charlotte's wife. Yes. Charlotte's husband. Yes. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay. All, All right. right well, let's do the round robin. Okay. So the round robin is uh, kind of what we do in the, uh, in the, in the style of our, in our, our, of our movies. We hate episode. You know, we've just been, this is, this is a dunkable here. This episode is a dunkable. So let's do a say something nice challenge. What <laughs> is something good about natural born killers, is Tom, this you possible? Yeah. It's ironic oh. because I feel like we've been pretty kind to it, actually, by saying we almost like things. Well, in yeah, it's like yeah. It's true. Well, I mean, maybe that's maybe that's then related. Maybe this mutated. Sure. But okay. okay, we we referenced this earlier. I actually thought there was something valuable, somewhat about the uh, sitcom parody okay. of her sexually abusive household. I, I thought it was kind of fun and classic, sort of punk rock, almost like Dead Kennedys, like. In the background, you see like uh, the happy face sign over like the nuclear power plant and like um, and also, yeah, the sitcom music. I thought I don't know if he succeeded, but I appreciated where it was coming from. And it's totally very different than the rest of the film. And it's actually it's a, got it's got formal, wit. It's got yeah, wit exactly. It's wit. Thank you. Perfectly yeah. said it, it, it's it's an idea and it's concrete and it plays out and it's not crowded by other kind of bullshit uh, aesthetics. Sure. And it's a fully formed idea. And he did it. OK, right. John. OK, Marcus. I, I, Okay, so I liked the Mark Harmon kind of recreation of the Mickey. Uh, there's, they do a kind of like a, a dramatization of Mickey <sighs> Mallory. stole and, mine. And I, there's like Mark Harmon <laughs> being them. Yeah, I, for some yeah. reason, I liked that. <laughs> oh, uh, I liked Olan Jones in it. She's kind of weird. You know, she's like the organist in Edward Scissorhands. She's good. She's kind of a weird actress. Yeah. And yeah, and then actually, I've come around now. I actually like that Nine Inch Nails song. I'm yeah. okay. embarrassed to say it, but now sure I like it. I like it. Okay. I like it down. It's, it's a nice little melody. I, mm-hmm. um, yeah, you stole mine. Mine was going to be, it's kind of a safe choice, but I actually think it's well done is the parody of the hard copy sort of, you know, video that they make uh, early on in the film where, and I think it is quite clever and witty and you probably could have taken it a little step farther of showing the dramatic reenactments of these two. I mm-hmm. think that's that that goes more yeah, to illustrate that was the point. And that is th- that's fun and again I just go back to kind of the original idea of 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 that Quentin had with the film is it would have been much more interesting I think to be following a, a producer uh who's looking to, you know, sort of perpetuate yeah. this stuff in media versus us sort of being like yeah. In first-person shooter mode with these fucking you know killers, with Mickey are... and Mallory, Mickey and Mallory, <laughs> Mickey and yeah. Mallory. One more thing, Mickey there's said, a, um... There's a funny joke. That's my last thing. Uh, put it down. The guy, the cop drops the gun, and he's like, the cop drops the the donut and says, "No, the gun. Drop the gun." That was right. funny. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there you have it. Oh, my other than God. that, we loved it. We hit, we loved it. Okay. <laughs> Just kidding. Psych out. All right. That was uh, one fucking hour, everybody, on Natural Born Killers. We did it. I again. Think we, I think we went through some changes on that one. That was pretty intense. It was. I mean, you know what it, I mean? Yeah. It was about as focused as the movie, but still, I think mm. it's, you know, it, it's, it is remarkable that, you know, even talking about a movie like that, you get you get nervous about the clock, you know, that you might not get everything it's in funny, that you yeah. want to get in, you know, so, uh, but there well, you it go. It does stimulate some interesting conversation. Definitely. I'll say that. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And we also have, uh, of course, we didn't say this in the episode, but, you know, we have covered other Oliver Stone films, and I think that mm-hmm. uh, the 80s was a much more interesting decade for Mr. Stone because uh, we are fans of talk radio, which we've done. Shout yeah. out in the archives. Uh, right. We love Salvador, which we will do at some point. We, we will know. be doing for sure. Platoon is a is is still a uh, is still sure. a great interesting film. Good 
Good stuff. And so, you know, he's capable of it. It's just once, the, I think the trappings of success and drugs and, you know, blank yeah, checks. Yeah, I know. It's a classic story in a way. It's a classic he story. He got high in his own supply and he really just lost, he lost <laughs> totally. his way, starting with the yeah. doors, really. It's totally. Totally, Which totally. we also love for all we the do. reasons. We do, we do. So, all right, that was uh, One Fucking Hour on NBK. Now let's talk about um, next week real quick because we're moving along here in the decade. Going into 1995, uh, halfway Whoa. through here. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we're going to be taking a dive into a very interesting film. And uh, I'm very excited about this. I believe Raimi will be joining us next week for this, by the way. Um, okay. She's a fan. Uh, and we're going to be getting into this movie, uh, and I have it right here. Uh, Todd Haynes' Safe uh, is what we're going to be getting into for 1995. And uh, yeah, I mean, Todd Haynes, very interesting filmmaker. And again, it's a film that exemplifies, I think, that what's great about this decade. If Natural Born Killers is what's shitty about this decade, 90, yeah. you know, Safe is a, is, is a movie that sort of just shows, like, you know, a, a film like this, a sort of quiet disturbing subtle it's actually the antithesis of natural born killers mm. but that it could mm. exist and have a life and be you know critically acclaimed and be embraced um is what was great about this decade a lot of films like safe coming out new voices new directors coming out that are very interesting you know todd salons you know todd haynes and alexander payne yeah, and those sure. kind of guys so very interesting so if you haven't seen it one fucking hour uh, uh on safe will be next week and um Anything, any other business we got to shout out here before we uh, before we say good night? I think of uh, okay. you know we're uh, like I said we're at the the hump day of our little series which I'm enjoying immensely. Yes, know? we oh, love yeah. we love our '90s here, and we uh, do look forward to the remainders. And we're yes. we're cooking up the uh, titles as we speak. Right, so stay tuned. And I'm gonna miss the '90s when it's all over. Exactly, it's like, what are we gonna do? Let's just keep doing the '90s. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Actually, you know what? Scratch that. I actually miss the '90s like every day now. Uh, guys, oh, I've you been... mean just in the general sense? Well, right? yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, both. Well, yeah. well, well. Who's fucking listening to Limp Biscuit all the time? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, me and uh, Evan. Right. Well, I'm gonna go me. jam some Nine Inch Nails that right after yeah, there this. You go. That's and right actually, out. no. You know what's a breakthrough for me is I've come around and I like that Leonard Cohen song, the main theme of uh, NBK. Wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was well, it was associated with the film, but then I kind of went like, all right, what's this song? And I let it happen, and it was, it was pretty satisfying. I like yeah. those weird that weird era of synthes bad synthesizer. Uh, right. Leonard Cohen is pretty interesting. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Like old boomer well, synth. You well, know? Guys, synth, I've been the trying. wrong synth. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, no, totally. Yeah. Guys, I, synth. I've been trying to get you guys to just, you know, finally allow us to deep dive on the 30s. So hopefully we can get some 30s. Oh, films in. get at it. You know, that's like almost a challenge. Like, I know. <laughs> let's, let's do that. Let's have a series coming up, which is like the boys do the 30s. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go because we could do Wizard of Oz. Sure. Some Busby Berkeley. You know? Dude, there's great sure, movies. In the 30s. There's, there's other there's, stuff. Yeah, there's great you know, movies, you know? Yeah. Of we, course. we get through it. We'd barely get through it, but we would do We, we could do the twenties if you want. That would be more of a challenge. Forties might be kind of kind of tough. Actually. An hour Unless, talking about silent movies. <laughs> <laughs> that's not though, well that we could do a show on the silence, I think. Well, I don't know. I, we could do you know, we could do anything. M we, is in we, the thirties. You it's got not a uh, Freaks is the 30s. Oh, yeah, we're done. Fra uh, uh, Dracula and Frankenstein. <laughs> Invisible right. Man is the 30s. Uh, Duck Soup Dick. is the 30s. Uh, dude, Marx Brothers all day. Absolutely. Yeah, we got some shit we could do. We could do it. We're doing it. In, yeah. in 2025, it's the Project 2025 for one second. <laughs> it's uh, the 30s. <laughs> all right, you have been oh, warned. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's going to be one fucking hour in the 30s coming up for 30s. Project 2025. So. And we're going to have a black and white filter. Uh, yes. On, you know, there like, you go. And like grain. There you go. There you Popping go. splices. <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ. And All like, right, everybody. A, phone, a filter in our voices. Like, yes. Mm -hmm. Hello. And okay. Welcome yeah. to one fucking Any hour. Makeup. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. I, I don't know about you guys. I can't wait. That's okay. like a blast. <laughs> I can't wait either. <laughs> All right, like everybody. Well, thanks so much for uh, hanging out with us. Uh, again, quick shout out to the One Fucking Hour Patreon, patreon.com slash one fucking hour, or join the channel on YouTube by clicking the join button underneath the video. It's just five bucks a month. And we'll have our new bonus episode up there uh, very shortly, which, of course, is uh, on the 90s films we have not seen. And the embarrassing right. sort of, uh, and, you know, and, we're, we're going to admit these. No cheating. Uh, in terms of what we've never seen and what we think the movie's about. 
which I think is going right. to be very yeah. exciting. So like blind, I call it blind synopsises, you know? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. It's the best. You know, because there's, there's going to be some, some doozies in there for sure. Um, so yeah, <laughs> only available on the Patreon. And of course, and next, hey, you know, yep. I wouldn't mind hearing comments on, uh, well, always, uh, but if anybody has some thoughts on Natural Born Killers on, on this episode and our discussion and uh, defending it, hating it, or, or you know, neutral, um, I'd be curious, you know. Mm-hmm. Be careful what you wish for, but yeah. No, people, well, uh, no. no, I'm just messing. But, you know, people, you know, yeah, if, if you have a different opinion on it, I, I know some people still like it. You know, shout out to my homegirl at, you know, um, Enterprise Car Rental. You know, it's her favorite yeah, film of all day. Time. 4 a.m. <laughs> car rental. 4 a.m. <laughs> car rental. Um, but, you know, just, yeah, let us know in the comments. Yeah, and I don't mean, <clears throat> it doesn't have to be adversarial. It's just like, not even like, here's where you guys are wrong or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's more just like, um, yeah. you know, to defend Natural Born Killers. But just, yeah. I'm just wondering, like, yeah. I'm wondering now in 2024 what yeah. what people are thinking about. What that. do you like about it? <laughs> yeah. well, no, I'm just like like because this is it's been 30 years. Like like how did, how do did a lot of people feel like what? Because it was then was an yep. experience for people. Right. Like, yep. I think I happened. might like it more now than I did then, even though I hate it. You know. Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. Yeah. So I don't yeah. know. So all yeah. right, everybody, <clears throat> let's get out of here. Um, but before we do, uh, this is going to be quite fun. Uh, yeah. uh, we can't leave you without your moment of zen. <laughs> All right, everybody, and we'll see you next week uh, for safe. And Tom, you'll be in New York, by the way, so we'll we'll, yeah, we'll be so together we'll for you next week. There. All uh, right, everybody, take space. care, Beat and space. we'll see you soon. So long, bye. bye. Say goodbye to the people, bye. Tom. Bye, people. Okay. Bye. Oh, it came out in '94. It came out the same year as Pulp Fiction. No, not at all. I mean, not that I've seen it all from beginning to end. Well, and also one of the I'm mean, one of the things not to. I'm not trying to pump myself up, but one of the things about that script in particular was, uh, particular, I guess, is um, I was trying to make it on the page. And so when you read it, you saw the movie. Yes, man. And it was like, why didn't he do at least half of that? <laughs> it was like done for him. Oh, no, no, no. You know, there was that whole moment where actually where, um, in fact, it was funny. I didn't see this, but it was like my guy, the friends of mine at the video store, you know, they had read the script for two years before it was ever yes. made. And then, the, you know, and then they're like, oh my God, Quentin, there's this whole scene in the movie where um, Mickey is fucking Mallory. Yeah. And then he like looks at a, a female victim who's tied up in the corner and he starts fantasizing about her. And they, and they go, Mickey would never do that. Right. <laughs> Mallory would never cheat. Mickey would. I mean, the, the the point of the thing is they unnaturally live for each other at the expense of everybody else on the planet Earth. Motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. <laughs>